I want to start off by asking you guys a question. Is uh, what, what are keys for? Like, what good are these things for? What do you use this for? Um, Melissa's family is going to hate me for sharing this, um, but they're always locking themselves out. Melissa's my wife, by the way. And so the in-laws, they're always locking themselves out of the house. Well, at least they used to oh, quite often. Melissa's family, my wife's family is really big. She has a lot of siblings. And uh, in my in-laws, now, now they're almost empty nesters. All the kids are pretty much married and they moved out of the house. Um, and they're almost all gone now. But it wasn't always like that, of course. In the home, everyone has a pair of these. Everyone has a pair of keys. But they would always be locked out. They never took the keys with them when they left. They would always be locked out. In fact, even after the fact we got married and moved out of the house and everything, they still would call Melissa. Hey, can you come and let us into our house? He's not living there anymore, and she had to come and bail him out. This has happened so often. It's amazing to me. It's a, it's a phenomenon even, maybe the eighth wonder of the world. So many people, so many keys, endless possibilities, yet they were always locked out all the time. And most of the time, they wouldn't even realize they were locked out until the end of church. They would go to church, and they'd be like, all right, oh, look, what time is it? All right, it's time for me to go home. Can I get the keys? Wait, I thought you had the keys. No, ask your father. Pa, you got the keys? No, I thought your mom had the keys. And nobody had the keys. They were always locked down. They wouldn't even find out until the, the, the end of the day. What good is it to have something if you don't put it to use? What good is it to have something if you don't put it to use? Hold on to that thought for a second. We'll return to that in just a minute. But I want to give you guys our big idea today, okay? In case... Uh, You came in a little sleepy and you doze off and you fall asleep. So I want to make sure you write this down. Okay. so you came in with some message notes in there. There's some fill in the blanks. That's for you to write in there. So you you have a pen. Feel free to take notes if you wish. Just a way to keep you guys focused and following along and tracking um, with everything that we're talking about today. But our big idea, just in case you snooze off, is this. By imitating Christ's humility, we can be light in a dark world. By imitating Christ's humility humility, we can be light in a dark world. This is exactly what Paul is going to be telling us in today's passage, which is found in his letter to the Philippians. It's what we've been talking about these past four weeks. Basically, what he's going to say that if we're going to imitate Jesus, if we're going to follow his leadership and mimic his humility, it will allow us to stand out. It's going to allow us to stand out, not in a way that's going to bring us glory or the way that's going to develop some sort of selfish pride instead that it might ultimately point to a loving God and today as we're concluding our series selfless new year less me we began this series by saying that resolutions are great it's a good idea it's a good thing to set goals but what if in addition to whatever your personal goals were that we added being less me focused and more others focused this new year We've been studying through Philippians chapter 2 as a guide for us. I've asked you guys to read the chapter over these past four weeks. So hopefully as you found time in your studies of scripture, you've been able to have some time to read over Philippians chapter 2. But the picture that Paul paints for us is one of looking at Christ's humility as an example for us to follow. And he shares... He shares how Jesus was ruling and reigning for all eternity with all authority in heaven. And then he's brought down. He he humbles himself. He leaves his throne in order to become one of us. Jesus was born. His whole purpose of of being born was so that ultimately he would die to pay the punishment for our sins on the cross. And one of the things that Paul's going to say to us through today's passage is that something we've meant, it's something that we've mentioned throughout all these past couple of weeks, and that is a Christian is not a person who simply says they are. Right? He's not just simply by the claim. You're not a Christian just because you say you are. You're, a Christ, you're not a Christian because your parents were. Right? You don't inherit their Christianity. You're not a Christian because you were born in Texas, Georgia, Oklahoma, or somewhere along the Bible Belt. Or you're not a Christian because you checked that off on the last census, okay? That's not what makes you a Christian. No, being a Christian is not simply stating you are. Do you not only talk the talk, but also walk the walk, right? The proof is in the pudding, as they say. And if we are followers of Jesus, there has to be a noticeable difference about the way we live our lives, And when that happens, what Paul is telling us is that when that happens, we put Jesus on display for everyone to see. The world will see that Jesus truly does make a difference. It's not simply a shared belief. 
is not simply a perspective that we have. No, Jesus changes. Jesus transforms and Jesus redeems lives. He can do it to you too. So the question we want to answer today as we look at today's passage is this. How can we be light in a dark world? world that's the question we're trying to answer today how can we be um how can we be lights in a dark world here's the first thing paul's going to tell us number one in your notes is to put your salvation to work put your salvation to work here's how he says it in philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13 it's up on the screen and it's also um, in your notes it says this therefore my dear friends just as you have always obeyed so now not only in my presence But even more, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Would you guys just underline where it says, work out your own salvation? We're going to talk about that. Verse 13 says, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. You know, there's something about us as sinful human beings that we... That, that makes us to love to cut corners, right? We, like, we love shortcuts. You ever heard the saying, while the cat's away, the what? The mice will play, right? And as long as we have someone looking over our shoulder, be it at job or doing your chores at home or whatever, as long as someone is looking over our shoulder, we'll do what we have to do. But the moment they're gone, we're back to looking for shortcuts again, right? We're back to cutting corners and doing what we want to do. And in a way, what Paul is saying here in verse 12, he's saying, listen, I, I, I know the saying. I know that when the past is away, the church will play. I know that. But, you know, I, you know, while I'm here, you're doing a great job. While I'm here and I'm supervising and I'm around, you're being obedient. But don't do that. Thanks for obeying when I'm around. But even when I'm gone, even in my absence, continue to obey. You know, it's so funny to me as uh, the pastor of this church that whenever people around me, they catch themselves about to do or say something they shouldn't. You know, it happens all the time. They catch themselves. For example, they'll probably say a word that they shouldn't say. And they'll be like, oh, f- 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 fiddlesticks. Uh, I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> and, and they'll do that in front of me. It happens all, all, the, all the time. By the way, guys, if there's something that you don't feel comfortable saying around me, maybe you shouldn't say it when I'm not there either. But you see, for Paul, he's telling the Philippians to obey even in his absence. Not because he's going to go plant another church or because he's going on another missionary journey. He's saying this because his life is actually literally on the line. He's approaching termination. He's about to die. And so he's pleading with the Philippians. He's saying, listen, continue what you're doing even when I'm not around. Because I'm not going to be around for much longer. So please continue to obey Christ's commands. Then he says, work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Now it's important for us to pause here and examine this. Because many have misinterpreted this passage right here, this verse, these couple of words, to formulate a false doctrine, a false teaching. For example, a lot of religions like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons, they would say, you see, this verse tells you that you have to work out your salvation. You have to. You have to earn your salvation by doing works. But you guys, what the Bible and Christianity teaches is something that's completely different. It's something very, very different. The Bible teaches us that we cannot earn our salvation. You cannot perform enough good deeds in order to purchase your salvation. By the way, the moment that you think that you can, you cheapen Jesus' work on the cross. You put a dollar sign. You put an amount to how much it costs you to earn your salvation. You cheapen and you weaken the power of the cross. But you cannot purchase your salvation. Our salvation, our forgiveness of sin is simply a free gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. He paid the penalty for our sin. And we are offered this free gift of grace. You don't earn it. We simply receive it. It's a free gift of God's grace. So then what is Paul saying when he says this, when he says, work out your salvation? What he's saying, what what does that mean? He says, work out your salvation. He doesn't say work for your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. In other words, because we have experienced God's free gift of grace, because you receive this free gift of salvation through Jesus, because we have experienced so much mercy, so much love, because you've experienced so much forgiveness, This ought to be in turn reflected in how we live our lives. Because we've experienced so much from Jesus' grace, then it should be reflected in how we live. 
And in case there was any confusion, look what he says in verse 13. Just in case you're confused by what he says, he says, it is God who's working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Not coming from you. All right? God puts in us the desire to serve others, to consider others more important than ourselves, and to follow Christ's example of humility. Remember what we said in the beginning? What good is it that you have something if you don't put it to use? This massive grace that we've experienced through Christ, all this that we've experienced compels us to share that grace with others. The grace that we've been extended through Jesus Christ, the pardon that we've received from Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, it begs us, it compels us to go and share that with others. How can we be lights in a dark world? Put your salvation to work. What does that look like? Well, it looks like maybe like you being a good neighbor to those that live right next door to you. Maybe it looks like loving and serving those that are around you, especially those that don't look like you. Maybe it looks like extending grace and extending forgiveness to to others and those that have harmed you. It looks like caring for your community, caring for this neighborhood, caring for Bushwick. And it looks like bringing a piece of heaven down from heaven here to earth. How can we be lights in a dark world? Put your salvation to work. Here's the second thing that Paul's going to say. He says, quit grumbling and arguing. Quit grumbling and arguing. Um, and as you guys can see, not too creative with my uh, wording here. He says right from the verse, chapter 2, verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Here's a question for you guys. What do you argue and grumble about the most? What do you grumble and argue about the most? We can find a million and one things to grumble and argue about, can't we? It's easy, the drop of a dime, so easy. It's easy for us because in part because of our fallen and sinful nature, right? so easy for us to find things to grumble and argue about. But especially in this passage, Philippians 2, remember what Paul's talking about here. All he's been mentioning has been in the context of Christ's humility. The reason it's so easy to grumble and to argue is because we always want to be right. So we always want to, we're always looking out for number one. I'm always right. What I say goes, right? And that's why we hum, that's why we argue all the time. In the Old Testament, we see how God miraculously he delivered the Israelites out of 400 years of slavery, 400 years in slavery under Egyptian rule. God delivers them. He does so by powerful demonstrations of his authority over nature. For example, the Israelites stand before the Red Sea and God miraculously parts the Red Sea with the, with the Egyptian army trailing behind them and the Israelites cross on dry ground. Miracle after miracle, they experience God's hand in mighty ways. And how do they respond? They find things to argue and grumble about. And you can read it all through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. You read the Old, the, Old, the Old Testament, you read the Israelites grumbling and arguing. But before you roll your eyes and suck your teeth about their attitude, think to yourself, what might have been your attitude in that situation? Look at what James says. I would love for you guys to read this verse with me together. It's James chapter 4, verse 1. And here's what it says. You ready? Read it with me. Go. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that make war inside of you. So where does that come? That desire to argue, that desire to, to grumble, where does it come from? And it comes from those selfish desires that are deep down inside of us, very, very deep beneath our sinful nature. So here's what's going to happen later, okay? You're going to, maybe no sooner than you walk through those doors, you are going to find, the temptation is going to be to find something to grumble and something to argue about. The moment, maybe the moment you step through those, through those doors, the moment you step into your car or you get on the bus on the train and go home, that's the first thing, the temptation is going to be to find something to grumble and argue about. In that moment, think about Paul's words. Think about, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Imitate Christ. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Here's our last point for today. The last thing Paul's going to say is this. Paul says, stay lit. I'll show you how he says it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. You guys don't believe me? I'll show you. It says it right here. 15 and 16 is in um, your notes. It says this. So that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation. 
among whom you shine like stars in the world. By holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. Would you guys just underline the part where it says right there in verse 15, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Underline that phrase right there in that verse. You see, because something amazing happens. According to Paul, when we actually adopt the same attitude of Christ, something happens. Something happens when we begin to live out Christ's humility, when we begin to imitate Jesus, when we begin to follow his leadership and his example, something happens when we actually flesh out what we say we believe. We're living in incredibly dark times, guys. I don't think anybody needs to tell you that. It's not a surprise. We're living in very dark times. And like Paul said, we find ourselves among a crooked and perverted generation. There is darkness. There is everywhere you look, there is ungodliness. Everywhere you look, there is sin all around us. And the temptation, <clears throat> the temptation is for us to run away or to cower in fear or to ignore it at all. But according to Paul, this darkness, it makes the perfect conditions for us to allow the light of Jesus Christ to glow and to shine even greater and to shine even brighter. Among the darkness of this world, if we imitate Christ's humility, if we apply and if we live by what we say we believe, we can shine like stars. We can be lit. In the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the perverseness, in the middle of the sin, in the middle of the darkness of this world, by following Christ's humility, Paul says, will shine like stars. And this is exactly what Jesus taught. You guys know the Sermon on the Mount. It's a a sermon that Jesus preached. Um, It's on Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. It extends three chapters. And in there, he reads this. I would love for you guys, um, the last verse, verse 16. I want you guys to read that with me. So I'll start off by reading verse 14. And in this, Jesus is giving the same contrast. He's explaining to us this very scenario, how we are light in the middle of darkness. And he's giving us, he's given us permission to be light in the midst of darkness. As this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, verse 14 says this in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. Ready? Let's read verse 16 together. Ready? Go. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others. Let your light shine. What good is it to have something so valuable if we never put it to use? By imitating Christ's humility, we can be light in a dark world. You have the opportunity to do so. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. In humility, consider others more important than yourself. What if in addition to all those wonderful New Year's resolutions and goals that we set every year, what if in addition to that we added being more others focused this new year? We might just shine bright for Christ and put the gospel on display for the world to see. If you're here today and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, right? maybe you're kicking the tires of Christianity and you just don't quite know, then I want to give you an opportunity to do that. In the beginning of today's message, Paul mentioned that uh, the working out of your salvation. right? He mentioned work out your salvation, but you can't do that until you received the free gift of salvation, right? You know, the Bible teaches us that we're all sinful by nature and by choice. And that that's the prideful and sinful voice saying to look out for number one, no matter the cost. And that sin is what creates a chasm between us and God. And what that sin deserves, the Bible says, is eternal separation from the holy God. But God in his love for us provided a way out. He provided an opportunity for us to experience forgiveness, an opportunity for us to experience joy and love and forgiveness and pardon, and for our relationship with Him to be restored. And He did this through Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life, the life that you and I couldn't live, and He was led to the cross so that He would die for the punishment of our sin. 
The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. What our sin deserves ultimately is eternal separation from God. But God is infinite for love for us since Jesus and Jesus dies in our place. And Jesus pays the punishment for our sin. And in his death, you experience forgiveness of sin. But three days later, he conquered the grave. And in his life, we can receive newness of life. And all you have to do, guys, to experience this forgiveness, to for, for experience this love, all you have to do is put your faith in him. You can't pray enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't read your Bible enough. You cannot earn salvation. It's a free gift. You put your faith in him. It's giving your trust to Jesus. Accept his free gift of salvation. It can never be earned, only accept it. And I want to invite you guys to do that today. If you've never done that, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, and if you feel like, man, you feel like now's the time. In your notes, you receive that connection card. Um, everybody will have an opportunity to turn those connection cards in. It's super important that you fill it out. Your first-time guests fill out as much information as you feel comfortable um, sharing. It's just our way to follow up with you and keep you connected um, to the church. But on the back, if you turn it around, there's some next steps for all of us. If you never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, then that's your opportunity to let us know. We're not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'll tell you to come to the front. We want to embarrass you. But this is your opportunity between you and God to make that decision. And as a church, we want to come alongside you, love you, serve you, and give you some next steps. So that's your way of letting us know. So if you never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity to do that now. You know, at the end of every series, we're wrapping up this series, we like to do something called communion. And it's our way of remembering. And so right now, uh, going around, you guys can grab um, a communion cup, and there's a juice and a wafer, and we're going to take communion together as a church um, family. Uh, this is something that is uh, the Bible says is for uh, Christians. So if you choose not to take communion, that's totally okay. You're in a judgment-free zone. Don't worry about it. Um, but as a church, we're going to take communion together. So just go ahead and grab one. And, uh, and you guys will notice you open up the top layer. There's your wafer. You can go ahead and open that. Jesus, um, right before he was led to the cross to pay for the punishment of our sin, um, he sat around a dinner table with uh, his friends. And he began to explain to them uh, that his life was soon ending. And he gave them this thing to do as in remembrance of him, to remember him. And so we do it as a church just to remember him. It's nothing special about the juice. It's just grape juice. Nothing special about the wafer uh, or bread or however you take communion. It's nothing special about it except that we are able to remember Jesus. Because so often we forget. And so often Jesus takes the back burner, right? And so we, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, knowing that so often we forget. And so he took a piece of bread and he broke it. He passed it around to the disciples and he told them, this is my body, which is broken for you. He was predicting, he was prophesying what would happen to him just moments later as he would be led to the cross and he would be whipped and he would be punched and slapped and, and spat on. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. Nails would be driven through his wrists and nails would be driven through his feet and he would be hung on a Roman cross for all the world to laugh at and mock and see. This is my body that's broken for you. The chastisement of our sin was upon his back. So this is what this represents. It represents his body. So as you take this, just go ahead, take out a moment to reflect, take a moment to repent of any sin, and just remember, remember Jesus Christ, you can partake of the bread. God, in this moment, we just take out a moment just to reflect, to remember that your body was broken for us, that you died for us so that we wouldn't have to. You paid the penalty for our sin so that we can experience forgiveness in life. So God, we take out a moment to reflect that. Thank you, Jesus. Then he passed around a cup of wine and he told his, he told his disciples to drink this. This represents my blood, which is shed for you. In the Old Testament, they would shed the blood of animals over altars and they would let the, the blood drip out. And what it represented was the cleansing of their sin. Their sin was um, symbolically Put on the animal, and the animal's life had to kill, it had to die. What it was symbolic of how serious our sin is before a holy God. And so the animal's life was ended, was terminated, and his blood dripped over the altar. In the New Testament, Jesus was our lamb. That was the first song that we sang today. He's the, the lamb that was slain, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so it was his, it was his blood. 
that was shed on the cross for your sin and for mine. So we wouldn't have to shed our blood. He took our place. He passed it. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. You can go ahead and partake of the juice. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that was shed in our place. The perfect blood of Jesus that wipes away the sin of the world. The beautiful blood of Jesus that washes us whiter than snow. We thank you for that precious blood. God, thank you for this series that comes with a reminder to exercise our faith and to demonstrate to the world the free gift of grace that we receive. We acknowledge our sinfulness. We acknowledge our pride. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to look at Jesus' example of humility and to follow his lead. When we are tempted to argue and to grumble, give us the humility to surrender to you and to count our blessings. We pray that by your grace, we might shine like stars in our world, in our dark and sin-stricken world. Let our light shine so that others may give glory to God. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.